So in today's podcast, we're going to look at a uh, brief look at the cosmic microwave background, or the CMB, as it's commonly known. Uh, the IB requires you to have an understanding of the CMB and to be able to describe its characteristics and explain how it is evidence for a hot Big Bang. So the first thing you should know is that it is evidence for a hot Big Bang. But what is a hot Big Bang? Well, the implication of Hubble's law, the implication of the expansion of the universe, is that the universe began approximately 13, 14 billion years ago, 13.77 billion years ago, as a singularity, as a, as a singular point in, in from which everything came. And it was, under our current understandings, the very origin of space itself and the very origin of time itself. And there is, uh, classically, you would say that it was impossible to do talk about before the Big Bang because there wasn't really a before for there to be a before about because it was the start of time. There are some debates about that and several multiverse, multiverse theories which discuss how our universe could be just one moment, theories of continuous inflation and, and things like that, which you can look up and research. But under the current uh, IB syllabus, we will interpret, we'll, we'll go with what is still the classical interpretation. It's still what, what most people perhaps say, which is that the, the universe, all of space, all of time, began with the Big Bang. And we have a pretty good idea of the physics of the Big Bang from everything before the Planck era. Um, the Planck era, which is 10 to the minus 43 seconds, an unimaginably short amount of time after the Big Bang, is um, when the temperature was a universe of greater than 10 to the 32 Kelvin. Before that, we don't have the physics yet to describe it. We don't have things like a quantum theory of gravity that we would need to properly describe what was happening. That doesn't mean that we never will. It just means we currently do not. The full details of what's laid out on this page and everything like that you don't really need to know. Not for the IB course. Nucleosynthesis at three minutes is where the protons and the neutrons, which, which the temperature of the universe had cooled by about a hundredth of a second after the Big Bang, 10 to the 11 Kelvin, in order to produce protons and neutrons. Um, and by three minutes after the Big Bang, those protons and neutrons combined uh, to form the three nucleons that we believe were formed during the Big Bang. Namely, hydrogen, one proton, one proton, deuterium, a proton with a neutron, and helium. Um, I'm not sure if it's just in the form of helium-4 or also in helium-3, which is two protons and one or two neutrons. However, these were still all completely ionized. The electrons were buzzing around the place, but the electrons were not bound to the nucleons, so there were no atoms as, as we understand them, no complete atoms. And one consequence of this and the, the extreme temperatures of the universe were that the universe was opaque to radiation. Photons may have been emitted, but they were instantly reabsorbed and then re-emitted in, in a random direction, etc. Photons were not able to pass through this medium. And that started to be possible about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, when the temperature of the universe dropped to 3,000 Kelvin. Around that time, the first photons uh, could be emitted and could travel through empty space. It wasn't actually completely empty at the moment of their emission, but by the time they had traveled um, appreciable distances, the universe had cooled down further, and they were therefore able to just carry on traveling through space. And they travel to this day. And what we detect when we point our radio waves, our radio telescopes up at the sky, is in part this uh, fingerprint, this leftover radiation from what is te technically known as the last scattering event, the last time the photon was absorbed and then re emitted. Um, Obviously, there are many other sources of radio waves out there in the universe, so it's not all of them, but, but a percentage of the static on an analog television, the hiss in the radio between the radio stations, comes from that primordial Big Bang. Why is it in the radio, technically in the microwave region of the spectrum? When it was emitted, it had a temperature of 3,000 Kelvin. It was a source temperature of 3,000 Kelvin, which would put it... Um, 
individual part of the spectrum. You could argue that the universe was once orange. Well, the fact is that between then and now, obviously, as we saw in our last presentation, the universe has expanded. And in the 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the Big Bang has expanded, become transparent. And this um, illustration shows it quite nicely. As the universe expands, the photons, the waves that are traveling out through the universe, get stretched out. They get expanded. And so what was once emitted at 3,000 Kelvin now appears to us to have a temperature of closer to 3 Kelvin. This was predicted, uh, first predicted in the 1930s as a consequence of the hot Big Bang. And by the 1960s, people had a good idea of what they were looking for, and there was a team looking for it. This is a photograph not of that team that had started actually looking for it, but a team down the road, uh, Penzias and Wilson, who worked for the Bell Laboratories, who uh, were looking for sources of, of radiation, not really, I don't think, for inherently for their scientific value, but actually as a source of um, error, errors and, and spurious transmissions when trying to do radio communication. And they detected this 3 Kelvin background radiation, didn't really know what it was, thought it might be pigeons pooping in their detector, uh, but someone put them very rapidly in touch with a team down the road who were actually looking for this background radiation and they wrote two papers uh, in the uh, Journal of Astrophysics or, or whatever. I've linked to them on the on the Dragonnet page. And uh, in one, a team describes the physics behind it and says, oh, and by the way, this Penzias and Wilson people may have discovered this. And Penzias and Wilson just technically describe what they discovered and their equipment, and they say, oh, and one possible explanation is from the other team. And that is what they detected. There's actually data from a, a more recent experiment, which we'll talk about in a minute. But you'll recognize it as your classical black body Planck spectrum. And it, the, the error bars are pretty small. That corresponds extremely well to a blank, black body radiation, with a peak corresponding to about 2.725 Kelvin. And that is pretty direct evidence for a hot big bang. Because, as we discussed earlier, any model of the cos universe, any cosmological model we develop, has to correspond to the matched observations. And no of the, none of the other models, uh, very famously Fred Hoyle proposed and, and uh, kept on proposing a steady state model until his death in, in 1990. Um, but he was never able to really adequately explain the black body radiation. And one of the issues of the black body radiation was that Penzias and Wilson, no matter what part of the sky they looked at, detected the same radiation. It was very smooth. And if the universe had been totally, totally smooth 380,000 years after its uh, formation, then that would lead to problems. Because you need differences in the output, the differences in the intensity of the radiation, which would really mean different densities in the um, fireball, if you like, the, of the primal, primeval universe. Because without those discrepancies, you wouldn't have had extra areas of density around which superclusters of galaxies, clusters of galaxies, galaxies, then stars, then planets, and us could have formed. The smooth universe is not the universe that we live in. People tried in the 1970s to look for what are called anisotropies. Anisotropies are these differences in the detected radiation. And in the 19, late 1970s, a team flying a high-altitude aircraft, a U-2, did detect an anisotropy, but it was a very smooth one. Um, and this was actually revealed to be our path through uh, the universe, so to speak. This is the motion of our Earth, our solar system, um, with respect to the sort of original motion of the universe, which is a very interesting concept. But they also detected a lot of radiation from the, our own galaxy, of course. So subsequent experiments had to remove both radiation from our own galaxy and this overall uh, Doppler shift anisotropy, um, which is something you could only do, these observations could only really take place in high-altitude uh, aircraft or, or, or satellites because um, the Earth's atmosphere smoothed out the radiation to be able to detect anything else. 
And the first successful satellite to detect it was the COBE, the Cosmic um, Background Explorer or something like that, in 1989. And these are nice which correspond to temperature differences of 10 thousandth of a degree or so, are, uh, are very real things. Uh, later, subsequent experiments have refined the picture. So there's a, a picture from the W map, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy um, Project or something, and there's the Planck Observer. So you can see they have the same sort of details, but if you put the cursor at this particularly famously cold patch here, then you can see that data does persist right through. So they're taking increasingly high resolutions of the same image. And this was further evidence to support the current picture of the universe because it has those anisotropies which are required. If, if we weren't able to detect those, then the source of this radiation couldn't really have been the Big Bang because the Big Bang is what led to us. But the combination of the existence of the radiation at all and its mostly uniform nature, but combined with these small discrepancies on a, on a very small scale, is very convincing, compelling evidence that what we see was once and originally a very small, hot, dense fireball. Thank you very much.